We have an assortment of excellent anthozoans to look at, including this amazing sea pansy, Ranilla. Remember, no anthozoans have medusa stages in their life cycles, but they have plenty of other complexity going on in structure and behavior. We'll use this phylogeny to help us organize anthozoan diversity. As you can see, we have a number of species to look at. That's really helpful since no one species shows every feature perfectly. Looking at a number of different species helps to identify all the major features of anthozoans. We'll start in the large clade Hexacorelia, which includes the sea anemones or actinarians like this one, Nematostella vectensis. It's quite transparent, which is useful in getting oriented. Nematostella is an important model system in developmental biology, and I got these from a lab culture maintained by Dr. Deirdre Lyons at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. It does not occur in the wild in Southern California, to my knowledge, but it does in Central and Northern California and in Oregon and Washington. Next, we'll look at our local species, Corynactus californicus, which is a corallomorph. Looks like a sea anemone, but has some slight differences in form. It's really useful for understanding anthozoan morphology, in part because there are some very transparent color morphs out there. Here you can see through the oral disc into the gastrovascular cavity, seeing complete and incomplete septa. It's still hard to see details through the body wall, so I anesthetized some Corynactus, then preserved them in formalin. That made the body fairly stiff so that I could section them with a razor blade to see inside directly.
You can clearly see the short pharynx in a longitudinal section, as well as the sinuous septal filaments in the GVC below or aboral to the pharynx. Those filaments are loaded with nematocytes and with cells that produce digestive enzymes. So imagine being a chunk of food that gets brought into the GVC, you would immediately get wrapped in a covering of filament, which would not be good for your structural integrity. I sectioned a second individual as well and was surprised to see gonads on its septa. I assume that these are ovaries. Here's a cross-section of the column at the level of the pharynx. You can see pairs of complete septa alternating with pairs of incomplete septa. Here are a couple of examples of Corynactus getting food into the warm embrace of its septal filaments. To see the nighty of this species, I snipped off a tentacle with scissors and mounted it on a slide. For all views of structures using a compound microscope, I'll just indicate the magnification and you can use these rulers to measure. I'll put this set of rulers in a couple more places in the movie, but it might be useful for you to trace these onto paper so you can easily apply them to whatever clip you need. See the capsule of the fire dematocyst on the right? In the next two clips, we'll go down in magnification so you can estimate the length of the thread and compare it to the length of the capsule. It's fairly easy to induce those large nematocysts to fire by adding a little 1% acetic acid.
Lots of cnidarians have fluorescent proteins, and Coronactus is one of them. To see those, we can do the same kind of fluorescence visualization we did for the muscle of Scyphozoa fiery, but here we don't need to label them. They make their own fluorescent label. I can do that on a dissection microscope by putting on a filter that only allows green wavelengths through. I expect green to be the color the fluorescent protein emits. Right now everything looks green, that's because I'm shining white light on the specimen and the green component of that is passing through the filter. But if I turn that light off and illuminate the specimen with blue light only, which excites the fluorescent protein, the only green light that passes through the filter is that that was emitted by the fluorescent protein. We can record this on the microscope camera too, of course. Here's the specimen in white light. Here it is in white light with the green emissions filter put on the microscope. And here it is illuminated with blue light with the green emissions filter. So all bright green in this situation indicates the presence of a fluorescent material, which in this case is a kind of green fluorescent protein. The next species, Exaptasia pallida, is useful for showing a feature the previous two hexachorals did not have, Aconchia. This species is also a model system, this time for cnidarian algal symbiosis. It hosts photosynthetic dinoflagellates, just like most reef-building corals, and is a lot easier to grow in the lab for most biologists. Thanks again to Dr. Deirdre Lyons for providing me with these as well. The dinoflagellates make it hard to see into the body of the animal, so again I anesthetized and preserved an individual so we could see directly into the interior. Here's a cross section at the level of the pharynx. Again, you can see complete and incomplete septa. I'll use my forceps to point to where the six pairs of complete septa connect to the pharynx starting at 12 o'clock. The bit of tissue that connects to the pharynx is quite brown, has a lot of dinoflagellates in it. Here I'm pointing to the pairs of incomplete septa, though it looks like the pair that should be at 11 o'clock is missing. It's possible that I tore them off when making the section. You can see some relevant features in a longitudinal section too. Here's the body wall and the pedal disc down here. Here are the top and bottom of the pharynx. A complete septum connects the body wall to the pharynx on the left side. And on the right side, you see an incomplete septum with sinuous filament on its free edge. And below the pharynx you can see some filament, as well as lots of these white threads, which are aconchia. If you harass anthozoans that have aconchia, which is not all of them, they can release those aconchia in various ways. One is through pores in the body wall, which you can see here.
The concha also often take day trips to the outside world through the mouth. In both cases, in Exaptasia at least, the acantia can then be pulled back into the GVC. The concha that break off outside the body still move around. At higher magnification, a concha are really interesting. They are chock full of nematocysts of one particular kind with a long shaft and a very short thread. Akantia undoubtedly have defensive or offensive functions when they're out of the body, but when they're in the body, they probably help to kill prey and maybe digest it. Here's a time-lapse movie of a very pale exaptasia, not many dinoflagellates, feeding on a piece of red-dyed shrimp. Once the shrimp gets through the pharynx, you can see a concha crawling on its surface in the GVC. We haven't seen one feature characteristic of most anthozoans yet, the siphonoglyph. We can see it really well in a professionally made cross-section of Matridium. This is a section of a small individual at the level of the pharynx. In addition to one large siphonoglyph, you can see some pairs of complete and incomplete septa. The incomplete septa usually have filament in cross-section at their free ends. Here's a local anemone, Diadumini lineata, that reproduces asexually by petal laceration. Adult anemones move around slowly and they leave behind little chunks of their petal discs. Those regenerate into new anemones. 
This species is not native to California, but it's pretty widespread in bays and harbors. To my knowledge, it has never been seen to reproduce sexually in California, just by pedal laceration, which means that the whole population in a bay, for example, might just be one giant clone. One more actinarian, the common intertidal anemone, Anthopleura elegantissima. This boulder is covered with them. Anthopleura elegantissima reproduce both sexually and asexually, but all of these individuals were probably formed asexually, so they're probably all genetically identical. Even though the oral disc of Anthopleura elegantissima is not very transparent, you can still see complete and incomplete septa. There are many septa in this individual. For species that have algal symbionts, like Anthopleura elegantissima, it's easy to see those symbionts just by taking a tentacle clipping. Anthopleura does not have a contia. Instead, they fight with structures called acroragi. They are normally not inflated, but when an anemone senses a genetically different individual, it can inflate them and use them to attack. At the start of this battle, the acroragi are not inflated, but you'll see them soon. The anemone on the right is the more aggressive of the two. The one on the left is not much of a fighter.
We don't have any reef building corals in California, though we do have some solitary, not reef building scleractinian species. In our collections, we do have some skeleton from reef building scleractinians, though. I do not know where it was collected. Here are the skeletons of a few different species. For most, you can clearly see the cup of calcium carbonate, the coralite that each polyp lived in. On to the octocorals. Internally, these are much simpler than hexacorals, but they often form complex colonies. We have two species to look at, starting with the C. pansy Ranilla calicari. This is a colony of several different types of polyps, of which the most obvious one here are the autozoids, polyps that are used in both feeding and reproduction. The big flat heart-shaped part, the rachis, and the stalk-like part at the bottom, the peduncle, are both part of the primary polyp. The planula metamorphosed into that polyp. And coming off of the rachis are two other types of polyps, the autozoids, the long normal-looking polyps, and the siphonozoids, the small white bumps on the surface of the rachis. The latter are used to pump water into the colony using cilia. The water pressure they generate forms a hydrostatic skeleton. That and epithelial muscular cells allows the whole colony to move.
Here you can see autozoids and siphonozoids. You can also see one special siphonozoid, which I'll point to with forceps. This is the exhalant siphonozoid. All the others bring water in. This one lets water out. Autozoids can be retracted into the colony, or they can be extended out. It's hard to see septa in the polyp since they're so transparent, but they are obvious in a cross section of a polyp as shown here. Octocorals always have eight complete septa. They are very straightforward that way. The rachis is kind of mysterious. I've never looked inside, but I did that for this video after anesthetizing and preserving a sea pansy. There are eight sheets of tissue, which look like septa, in each of those chambers. The gonads are on those sheets, but it looks like they're not on the two on the top, only those on the sides and bottom of each chamber.
Ranilla is really well known for its bioluminescence, which is amazing to see in person. My cameras are barely able to see it though. Here's what I was able to capture by taking a sea pansy into a completely dark room and poking it with my finger. The light given off there is clearly green, but the bioluminescent chemical reaction gives off blue light. That blue light is being converted to green light by GFP in the tissue. We can see where that is like we did before for Carnactus, just by viewing Ranilla on a fluorescent microscope. So it looks like the GFP is concentrated on the clusters of siphonozoids. One more octocoral, the California Golden Gorgonian, Muricea californica. Gorgonians are colonies with usually only one type of zoid, so they're not polymorphic. This is a fragment of a larger colony. The polyps are mostly covered by these red-brown spicules, which gives the colony its base color. You can see the eight complete septa in these oral views of polyps. The colony is supported by an internal skeleton made of a protein called gorgonin. I wanted to see that gorgonin skeleton in Muricea, so I sectioned it at its base and near the tip of a branch. You can see colony tissue surrounding the skeleton. The central white material in the skeleton is called the medulla, and the dark brown layers of protein surrounding that are called the cortex. In the section from the branch tip, one polyp seems to be brooding an egg or an embryo.